Hi, everyone. On behalf of the American College of Cardiology and the Center for Systems Improvement, I'd like to welcome you to this module in the EMS and Systems of Care webinar series, Taking Clinical Quality to the Next Level. Unfortunately, our usual moderators for this webinar, Tim Fallon and Tom Boothelay, are both unavailable for today's session. My name is Kelly Wiseman from the American College of Cardiology, and I'll be filling in to, for today's moderator. This is the seventh module in this webinar series, and it will explore some ideas for establishing clinical performance requirements in EMS. And today's webinar will include a panel discussion with some guest experts to help provide some additional insights and perspectives. Joining us on today's panel, we have Tom Weiserek from the Center for Public Safety Management in Washington, D.C., Glenn Leland from Priority Ambulance in Knoxville, Tennessee, and Dr. Jeff Jarvis from Williamson County EMS in Georgetown, Texas. Mick will provide some additional information on our guests when we get to the panel discussion. But before we begin, I wanted to let everyone know that part of the webinar is a recorded video, which will appear in a pop-up window. If you experience problems seeing the video, you may need to disable pop-up blockers in your web browser. If you're watching this webinar live at any time, please feel free to enter any questions or comments you might have into the question box in the GoToWebinar. Look for the question tab in the control panel. Click on it to open that section up and enter your questions or comments into the space provided. Our panelists will be joining us for this part portion, and I will select some questions to answer on air as time permits during the question and answer portion of the webinar. If you're watching this as an archive recording, please feel free to send any questions and comments directly to mick at improvethesystem.com. The archive recording will be posted soon after the live session with an email notice and viewing link sent out to everyone who registered for this event. Mick will do his best to respond to questions and comments sent in by email, regardless of how long after the live event you will send them. Presenting today's webinar is Mick Gunderson, president at the Center for Systems Improvement, which specializes in elevating the performance of community and regional systems of care for high-risk, time-sensitive conditions, as well as providing EMS system assessments and quality improvement training services. The ACC works with the Center for Systems Improvement in Development of EMS and Systems of Care related programs and services. Thanks, Kelly. I appreciate everybody uh, joining us for the webinar today. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and jump right into the video, so uh, bear with me for just a moment while we get that started. It will appear in a, a pop-up screen for you in just a moment. This CMS and Systems of Care webinar series is brought to you by the American College of Cardiology's National Cardiovascular Data Registry. They provide the chest pain myocardial infarction registry and its new reporting tool, NCDR eReports EMS. This new tool generates STEMI and NSTEMI reports for your specific EMS agency or regional system of care using the data that's already been entered by your receiving hospitals. For more details, check it out at acc.org forward slash eReports EMS. You can also access the prior webinars from this series in the resources section of that page. Government plays an important role in protecting public safety and public interests for a wide variety of products and services. We see this with quality requirements for everything from building codes to aircraft and automobiles to hospital care to medical devices. These government quality requirements work on behalf of the public and consumers, particularly when they do not have the technical ability or are not in a position to adequately address quality on their own. And this is certainly true at the time of a medical emergency. When someone is having a heart attack, they need to access care as soon as possible. The public does generally not have the technical knowledge to adequately address the clinical quality of care provided by EMS. And they're certainly not in a position to even try to make an assessment of clinical quality by doing some comparison shopping 
before deciding which provider to call. So there's an important role for government to play in such circumstances to make sure EMS is delivered with appropriate quality. State government will often set or adopt standards for ambulance and rescue vehicle design, for the equipment and supplies to be carried on board, as well as vehicle staffing levels. And this is done through licensure requirements. In addition, state government typically sets or adopts standards for EMS field personnel with training and testing requirements through certification or licensure processes. But units of local government, such as cities, counties, special taxing districts or fire districts, or designated EMS regulatory bodies, are commonly empowered by states to influence EMS quality in much deeper ways. One of the most powerful and least utilized tools that units of local government have is the ability to choose who the providers of EMS are in their community. And that ability provides the leverage to do a lot in support of higher quality. They can decide if their fire department, a neighboring fire department, third service EMS agency, private company, volunteer service, or any other entity will be the one designated to provide emergency ambulance service, non-transport medical first response service, and even emergency medical dispatch services in their jurisdiction. They can decide to keep the current fire-based EMS service, the incumbent third service provider, the long-standing private or volunteer ambulance service, or decide to go in a whole new direction. The choice is theirs to make, and this is often referred to as allocation of market rights. And the power of local government can be used not just to select the providers of the various elements of the EMS system, it can also make the allocation of market rights conditional to meeting performance requirements, and that's even more leverage that can be used to drive quality. Now, for privately operated services, we commonly see this in the form of performance-based contracts that contain response time requirements. For government-operated services, there may be some performance time requirement expectations, but those expectations are usually not as formal and do not have the same enforcement leverage we see with well-written performance contracts that are issued to private ambulance services. Unfortunately, in most communities, there usually aren't any specific performance requirements at all for response times or much of anything else related to patient care. There's just an expectation that the provider, whomever it may be, public or private, will do their best to serve the public's needs and interests. But there's an opportunity here for local government to do much more to assure and improve and even advance quality levels in EMS. Currently, in most communities, EMS-related performance requirements and the consequences for failure to meet them are typically limited to response times. The implicit assumption here by local government seems to be that getting there fast equates to high-quality emergency medical care. This thinking is likely to be driven more by the precedent of past practices than medical science. Since the public and elected and senior appointed government officials are not really in a position to know the technical details of what constitutes high quality emergency medical care, they're usually left with response times as their marker for quality. Now, back in the early days of modern EMS, there wasn't much medical science to inform what constitutes quality clinical care in EMS. It was all about getting there fast. But that's not true today. While there's still a long way to go in EMS research, we do know more about what EMS can and should do that makes a difference in clinical outcomes. So perhaps it's time to bring our local performance requirements up to speed by looking beyond just response times and consider what communities should expect to happen clinically when EMS responds to a medical emergency. Those expectations can be expressed in terms of clinical performance requirements with associated performance measures and standards. They can apply to the emergency medical dispatch providers, the non-transport medical first response agencies, and the ambulance service. The performance requirements could even be established at a systems level to consider the combined impact of the various categories of EMS providers along with the hospitals they could get evaluated as a system of care in addition to having accountability for their individual organization performance levels. But for today, I'm gonna to focus on the performance requirements for individual EMS provider organizations. But please keep in mind that this can also work with some minor modifications at a systems level. 
There's a couple levels of implementation at which performance requirements can be applied and reported. We can start by requiring the data be collected and performance measures be calculated by the provider. At this early stage, they might not have to report the results. They just need to do it internally. This can give them a chance to work out their processes for sound data collection and analysis and begin to find ways they might improve and begin to make those measurable improvements. But with this granting of a ramp-in period to allow the provider to establish data collection and analysis processes, there should be a clear plan for how the transparency and accountability levels for clinical performance will ramp up over time. At some predetermined point in the future, the provider should be required to start reporting their performance measure results to the city manager or similar senior appointed official at a level above that of the EMS provider organization. This starts to establish some transparency and external accountability. These results might not be purposely distributed external to the provider agency or the city manager or similar official at this point. This gives some time for everyone to get comfortable with the measures and the way the results are reported. Technically, it's public information at this point, but someone would have to know about it and ask for it if desired. It can also go to all of the supervisors and the rank and file members of the various EMS provider organizations at this point. And this will help them also get accustomed to the measures, see where performance levels are, and understand that external clinical performance accountability is starting to be established. At the next predetermined point in time, the performance measure results can be reported to the municipal council or a similar body of elected officials at a public meeting. The results now get included in meeting minutes, which are more publicly known and accessible. But again, someone would have to go to the meeting or access the minutes to see the results, and that's still not very transparent and does not establish all that much public accountability. The next step should also occur at a predetermined point in time, and this next step provides much more transparency and much more public accountability. This is when the report is intentionally distributed to key external stakeholders, including the media, so that the general public, the most important stakeholder, can be informed about how well EMS is performing. This very public report should be clearly designed with high quality infographics. It should explain the measures, why they are important, and show the current and past performance measure results over time, perhaps as a simple run chart with monthly or quarterly values as far back as data is available. And ideally, the local results are shown with an overlay of state and national numbers for the same measures. In addition to all the members of the city council and county commission and the media, these reports should also be sent out to all the hospital CEOs, emergency department directors, and the directors of the cath lab, the stroke lab, trauma team, sepsis team, etc. The release of the report should be the topic of a press conference to answer questions from the media, and that provides a wonderful opportunity to highlight improvement projects intended to take clinical performance to even higher levels and address any issues that may be showing up in the results. So why all of this publicity? It's about transparency, accountability, and political capital, especially when EMS is provided by government-operated services. We'll come back to this point in a few minutes. Now, as these clinical performance measures are put into place, the question will come up on what level of performance should be expected. So far, we have just been talking about reporting the measures and showing how the values are changing over time. In that situation, we will want to see things trending in a positive improvement direction. But sometimes, we'll have enough science on the clinical measure to know more specifically where we want performance to be. But in many cases, we won't. So we'll need to figure that out over time, perhaps on the basis of best practices. Let's consider an example. We know that when EMS crews encounter a patient that presents with signs and symptoms that are highly likely to be from STEMI or another type of acute coronary syndrome, it's important to quickly get a 12-lead ECG and make a decision on declaring an EMS STEMI alert. That process needs to happen as soon and as accurately as possible so that the hospital can be notified and make preparations so that by the time the patient arrives, definitive care in the cath lab can also begin as soon as possible. 
So we might start tracking and reporting how long it takes from the time of EMS crew contact with the patient to getting that initial 12-lead ECG on patients with initial presentations that clearly should have 12-lead acquisition. This group is commonly identified as patients age 35 or older with non-traumatic chest pain. Patients with these criteria are chosen for performance measures because they're less likely to be any debate about the need for a 12-lead ECG in their early assessment. At the very start, the performance measure may be to track what percentage of such cases got a 12-lead ECG while in the field and report that number each month. We might then take it up a notch by requiring the EMS providers to report the actual time intervals along with a calculated average or median value to reflect the overall organization performance level each month. We might also require calculation and reporting of the 90th fractile, the time at which 90% of the cases in the month had received a 12th lead ECG. Now, so far, we're just getting transparency on how long this important process step is taking. That alone can be a huge step forward to improve quality in many EMS systems and STEMI systems of care. After doing all this a while, people will have refined their data collection, aggregation, analysis, and reporting processes. Some trust will have been established. All of the organizations involved, regulatory or provider, may be ready to take it to the next level. After watching that EMS first medical contact to initial 12 lead ECG capture number for a while on the non-traumatic chest pain patients over 35 years old, and studying the time distribution of the cases, we might see that 90% of those cases are getting the 12 lead ECG in less than 10 minutes. We might even watch how the process works on cases that are the fastest and compare those cases to those which take much longer. We may discover that on the cases that are taking longer, there's usually some significant opportunities to go faster in ways that we observe on the cases with shorter times. That gives us a sound basis for setting a performance standard, one that requires 90% of the cases to have a 12 lead acquired in less than 10 minutes. We can encourage the providers to study and share what's being observed in the best performing cases with the lower performing cases to help all patients get the benefit of fast 12 lead ECG acquisition. We can follow the same steps on other time intervals, like the time from getting the first 12 lead when it's believed to be positive for STEMI to when the hospital is notified of the STEMI alert. We can take a similar approach to lots of other processes that are important to get right on STEMI cases, as well as other types of patient conditions. We start with reporting, get everyone comfortable with the processes, study the data, and study the processes. We want to see if we can find out enough about the processes and the causes of variances, preventable errors, and delays to set out expectations on how well we should expect that process to be performed, thereby setting a performance standard based on process observation and best practices from those observations. In some cases, there may be some scientific evidence independent of the process observations to guide where the performance standard needs to be set. Let's consider another example. We already know from the science that chest compressions yield the best survival rates from cardiac arrest when they are done at a rate between 100 and 120 per minute. That was discovered through scientific inquiry, not observation of best practices. We might also know from looking at the literature that many EMS systems have been able to reliably keep their performance in that range most of the time, which lets us know the performance levels based on research in this case are feasible to apply. So on that basis, we could set a performance standard for that sooner than later. So given that there is a way to establish performance requirements for collecting data, reporting them, and then meeting specific performance standards, how might these performance requirements be implemented? There's a couple scenarios there as well. Some cities, counties, and EMS regulatory bodies select their ambulance services through requests for proposals, commonly called an RFP process. Basically, it says if your EMS provider organization is interested in being their ambulance service provider, you're requested to submit a proposal. The request for proposals document issued by the community states what their performance requirements are. 
And this is where we commonly see response time requirements described. But this is also where clinical performance requirements in the RFP could be added and then included in the contract. Typically, the RFP and the contract are associated with procurement of a private ambulance contractor. If the incumbent private ambulance service provider does not get selected again through an RFP process, the incumbent company is replaced by the new one. In such cases, the rank and filed field staff mostly stays in place. It's the senior management team and, if applicable, their corporate parent that gets replaced. The rank and file staff will just end up working for a different company. But in most communities, we do not see RFP processes for EMS. In most cases, the incumbent ambulance service provider, private or public, is allowed to continue to provide service on a pretty much indefinite basis. So how do we bring clinical performance requirements there? If the incumbent is a private ambulance service, the unit of local government can introduce a performance-based contract. The incumbent provider may be allowed to continue, but it's no longer on indefinite terms. The privilege of being allowed to serve the community as the ambulance service can be made contingent upon meeting the performance requirements in the performance-based contract. If the incumbent is a government entity, performance requirements can be introduced through a document called a service level agreement, sometimes referred to as an SLA. Think of an SLA as a formal agreement between parts of the same unit of local government. In this case, an SLA would be between the government EMS provider and the unit of government that oversees them, whether that's a city or a county or whatever. The SLA can formally state what the performance expectations are for data collection, reporting, and meeting specified performance requirements. And perhaps an appropriate time to introduce the SLA may be at the time of budget preparations. Let the senior management team of the government-operated EMS service see the SLA with its performance requirements. Let them prepare their budgets with the clinical performance requirements in mind. There may be some negotiation and justifications needed if the government-operated EMS service asks for budget increases to help meet the performance requirements, but it also sets things up for putting the SLA in place as a condition for approval of the requested budget. The big difference between a performance-based contract with a private ambulance service and an SLA, as I've described it, with a government-operated service is in the consequences for failure to meet those performance requirements. When there's a private ambulance service, there can be a performance contract with explicit performance standards and explicit consequences for performance shortfalls to include fines and penalties and even contract termination leading to getting a replacement provider. On the positive side, performance that exceeds requirements can be rewarded with waivers of minor penalties, giving contract extensions, and other sorts of incentives. And this is all very well precedented. But when the provider is a government agency, those same negative and positive consequences are not on the table. So the consequences need to be in some other form and that can be in political capital. The very public reporting and accountability processes I've described impacts the public reputation of the agency, and that has implications for support of budget requests, salary increases, and the chances for advancement of the members of that provider agency's senior management team. Failing to meet performance requirements can have negative consequences, a loss of political capital. Budget requests and staff salary increases are harder to get approved. The chances for career advancement or any raises for members of the senior management team are diminished. But there's also the positive side to the SLA process for the senior management and rank and file staff of the government EMS provider. There are now some very explicit performance expectations they can work on and meet or exceed them and thereby add to their political capital. This can be something celebrated by both the city council, the senior management team, and the rank and file staff of the government operated organization. Too often, the lack of explicit performance expectations from the city council or similar oversight entity makes it hard to know what they might decide to hold the government operated EMS service accountable for. And that makes the items of accountability vulnerable to what direction political winds happen to be blowing that day. Keep the bigger picture in mind here. The objective of all this is to align patient and organizational incentives. 
make real and measurable improvements in the clinical processes that impact clinical outcome. That's what's in the best interest of patients and the general public. Do that, and it adds to the government EMS agency's political capital and helps the bottom line of a private ambulance service. When the clinical performance that matters is allowed to deteriorate, there are consequences for that too. This makes clinical performance accountability very, very real. So we've been talking about performance requirements in general for the last couple of minutes, and we've mentioned that response times have traditionally been the only such performance requirements in many places. But unfortunately, we don't yet see very many specific clinical performance requirements in RFPs and performance contracts for ambulance services. Nor do we see many service level agreements between municipal councils and their government operated EMS services, much less ones with explicit performance requirements. And that's one of the key takeaways from today's session. There's an opportunity here for units of local government to drive performance improvement by having explicit clinical performance expectations for EMS provider organizations, not just response times, regardless if EMS is provided by public or private entities. But what challenges might there be for a unit of local government trying to bring in such changes? How might we go about deciding what those clinical performance requirements should be? For insights on those questions, we're going to bring in some guest experts for discussion. Joining me for today's discussion, we have Tom Waskorik, Glenn Leland, and Jeff Jarvis. And we're going to start our uh, discussion today with Glenn Leland. Uh, Glenn is the Chief Growth Officer for Priority Ambulance, and he has more than 35 years of experience in leadership and strategy at national and international EMS companies. He's worked at American Medical Response as their Executive Vice President for Strategy, former President of the EMS Consulting Firm, The Fourth Party, and was Chief Operating Officer for the Emergency Medical Services Authority, EMSA, the regulatory agency overseeing EMS for 1.4 million residents in Oklahoma. Glenn holds a Master's Degree in Business Administration from the Kellogg School of Management at Northwestern University and is an associate professor at the Graduate Health Sciences College at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, where he teaches performance management and competition economics. Thanks for coming today, Glenn. Thanks for having me, Nick. From your perspective working on the private industry side of the performance contracting process, what is your reaction to the introduction of clinical performance requirements into RFPs and ambulance service contracts? Yeah, Mick, I think it's a fantastic concept. Uh, it's something that we've been toying with and playing with for, for decades, but haven't quite yet figured out how to put it in. Um, you know, so I, I obviously there are quality standards and performance measures beyond response time that are often included in RFPs and in the way system providers are governed. Uh, but the idea of how to capture the best clinical process measures and integrate them into the expectation set of the provider, I think is a wonderful idea. Um, it, it probably makes sense to take a step back, if, if you don't mind, and look at why response time is such an important measure. And my recommendation would be to add additional clinical process measures to response time, not replace response time as a measure. And the reason why is because response time by itself, while imperfect, it only measures one element of quality, it is a very meaningful uh, measure because it essentially is a proxy for efficiency. Um, and so I wouldn't recommend omitting response time standard, but adding additional process measures to, to response time. You know, so, so as an analogy, <clears throat> if you were going to measure some other quality. Let's use pizza delivery as a, as a often used <laughs> proxy for ambulance service. And you wouldn't want to look only at the speed of getting the pizza, right? So it, fast is not necessarily good when it comes to pizza. Uh, that is a factor, of course, how on time it is, but so would be the temperature of the pizza when it got there, the compliance to the ingredients. You wanted pepperoni and the pizza doesn't have pepperoni. That's not a good thing. Uh, taste. Uh, would be a factor, as, as would cost. You know, a million dollar pizza that got there on time and had pepperoni wouldn't be good. Uh, so fast alone is not the measure. There are other attributes that lead up to 
to quality as well that should be measured. The challenge, of course, is the same problem we have with response time. So in response time, the way we measure response time can have a significant impact on the system and the way we isolate and ascertain quality. Um, so if, if we're looking at my pizza coming to me or my ambulance coming to me, that's really the only one I personally care about as a consumer of these services. And so when the ambulance got there is, is meaningful to me. But as we look at it from a system designer or operator perspective, it isn't one ambulance ride or one pizza that we have to worry about, but in fact, a large group of them, you know, the totality of pizzas, the totality of ambulance rides. And so you can't just look at the on-timeness of that individual case by itself. You have to look at it amongst the many. And once you do that, then you run into a problem of, well, how do I summarize this in a meaningful way? Um, some systems use the average response time, which means half are longer than the standard and half are shorter, and it's not a very exacting way to measure timeliness. Um, others use, as, as you mentioned earlier, uh, use a 90th percentile, uh, sort of stack up all of the response times and look at which one hits the 90th percentile and how many minutes, hours, days that was, and then use that as a measure, which is obviously better than using an average because it's a more precise uh, you know, metric to use. Uh, but many systems still use average. Many systems vary in when they start the stopwatch and when they end the stopwatch, and which cases they choose to include in the measurement and the observation. And so as we go beyond response time and start to look at other things we might meaningfully measure to better predict clinical performance, then we have the same issues of, well, how do we define the data? How do we measure it? And uh, which items are kept in the consideration set? Um, then the next thing I'd throw out about response times and why response time continues to be an important measure is um, a guy named John Little uh, created a theorem. It's often referred to as Little's Law or Little's Theorem, which is in the discipline of, um, of operations math or um, queuing theory. And what he said was that the length of time that a process takes is equal to the inventory times the time that it takes in that process. So, so what does that mean? So if we were to imagine a small store, for illustration's sake, that this store can hold five people and it has one checkout counter, and the person at the checkout counter can complete the checkout process in two minutes. So if you came into the store, you're one of five, and it would take you 10 minutes to get out right? Because you're one of five standing in line for a two minute process. And so that would be the inventory would be the 10 minutes. You have 10 minutes of waiting capacity because the exit point takes two minutes and everything's fine as long as two people um, show up to the front door of the store um, on, on, a, on, a, you know, on a minute basis. So equal to the number going out. But what would happen if the store decides to run an advertisement and doubles the number of people coming in, would they still come out at the same rate? No, because the checkout hasn't changed. If you increase the capacity of the store and now it holds 10 people, what would happen? Would there be a line forming outside the store? Well, not at first, of course, because uh, by having more capacity, you could absorb an additional five people in the process it would take them longer to get through the process. And ultimately, you'd still end up creating a bottleneck and the line outside the store would grow because the exit point was the constraining force. So what does that mean for EMS? The analogy would be that the line outside the store is analogous to the response time. And it is driven by the capacity inside the store and the number and the frequency by which people check out. So I guess the point there is that, so response time really is an effective measure of the overall efficiency of the system to treat, transport, and return ambulances to service. And that's why I wouldn't recommend eliminating response time, but just as in the pizza example, 
just because it's fast doesn't mean it's good. We want to look at some other factors as well. So what factors might we look at if we were going to do this? Well, time is always going to be important in, in any kind of EMS thing, because the reason why we have EMS is to reduce the time to care by having a mobile response, having clinicians trained to a degree where they can assess and uh, interact with patients to reduce their pain and suffering in a short time frame. Pati all these same patients could ultimately get to their doctor without ambulance service, as we see in countries that don't have formalized ambulance systems, but they get care and they get transportation faster if they use EMS. So time always has to be an important measure. And, you know, Mick, in your presentation, you introduced, I think, a great example for us to look at in EMS, and that is the, the suspected STEMI patient. Um, if the paramedics, if we measure how long it takes the paramedics to recognize that a patient might be a candidate for STEMI and how long it takes them to obtain the 12 lead EKG and then how long it takes them to then notify the hospital uh, that they have a STEMI patient so the hospital can prepare for a PCI. I think that's a great example of using time as a measurement of a subset of ambulance response, which is this STEMI focused timeframe. But once again, fast is not necessarily good uh, because the accuracy, what if the paramedics quickly identified, yes, I have a patient, but they were identifying all kinds of patients who weren't really STEMI candidates and they weren't accurate at reading the EKG and instead were overstimulating the system and sending way too many patients who didn't need that intervention to PCI. It would not, it would not be good, right? So it's not just time, but it also then becomes the second topic and that is the accuracy or the compliance to the plan. How accurately can we do things? How often is it in, incorrect? Using the pizza example, how often is, do we not get the pepperoni on the pizza? How often are the ingredients not correct? Or how often do the paramedics miss the STEMI? That's not a time measure. It is a quality measure based on compliance to the plan. And then a third topic, if time, accuracy, are the first two measures. The third one that I often see in efforts to create a quality metric system is compliance to a set of prerequisite structures. Uh, the concept, accreditation would be a grand example of this, that we, we believe that quality will improve if there are certain elements in the system, if there's a uh, accreditation process, if there are certain types of equipment or certain amounts of equipment that that may be a measure of quality, not because having more Band-Aids in fact actually impacts an individual patient, but it might be a performance standard. So in, in, in answer to your question, yes, I think clinical performance measures are an important adjunct to response time. The key is finding the right ones to measure and how to incentivize improvements. No, great point, Glenn. And with all of the queuing theory things you mentioned, we have the same issues with the time intervals involving the emergency department throughput rate, the cath lab throughput rate, right. uh, et cetera, inclusion, exclusion criteria. So great points. And also a great segue to uh, Dr. Jeff Jarvis, our next panelist. Uh, Dr. Jarvis is the EMS Medical Director for Williamson County EMS and Marble Falls Area EMS in Central Texas. He maintains a clinical practice at uh, Baylor Scott and White Hospital in Round Rock, Texas. He's board certified in both emergency medicine and EMS. Began his career in EMS over 30 years ago, has worked in three states as a paramedic, and retains his air pack active paramedic license today. He teaches extensively, has authored multiple articles on EMS issues in both peer-reviewed and industry journals. His research interests include airway management and clinical performance measures, and he discusses EMS research on his podcast, the EMS Lighthouse Project podcast. Thanks for joining us today, Jeff. Well, thank you, Mick. I appreciate you having me. So with that so setup okay. from, from Glenn, if, if you could talk to us a little bit about, as an EMS medical director, What's your reaction to the idea of introducing clinical process performance requirements and what sort of clinical process measures do you think would be appropriate for EMS public reporting? 
Well, as an EMS physician and as a paramedic, I think it's about time. I have grown up as a paramedic in a system where the only thing that mattered was response times. And I was listening very um, intently to Glenn's answers about the importance of response times. And while I don't really want to dismiss the importance of response times, I clearly understand that they are important from an efficiency standpoint. And from a um, customer service standpoint, from a clinical aspect, there are very few times where we actually are looking at uh, time dependent issues where response times matter. So cardiac arrest is probably the largest, which is a small proportion of what we do. So I am a big believer that EMS is the practice of medicine. And I think it is about time that we start focusing on measuring the quality of the medicine that we practice. So I am very excited to see um, systems start to incorporate clinical measures into RFPs, for example, and incorporate them into uh, their measures for quality. So very, very excited. Now you ask which performance measures we should be looking at. Um, there are a number of these, and most of the ones that are out there now are focused on process measures. And in general, there are a couple of types of measures. There are structure measures, process measures, and then the ones that I think we and our patients care the most about are outcome measures. The challenge with outcome measures, meaning looking at the outcomes that are most important to patients, do they live, do they die, is their pain improved? Those are more of a challenge because the data isn't quite available yet uh, on a widespread basis. Process measures, though, are surrogates for those outcome measures. And I think we are at a point now where we can very easily measure these. And I think when you look at which measures to assess, probably the best place to start is in the public domain. So what are um, officially out there? So the NIMSQA measures, the National EMS Quality Alliance, um, exist to publish these measures and help facilitate benchmarking or comparison of performance between different like agencies. So just to give you an example of some of those measures um, that I would start with, uh, we can start off with pediatric measures. We know that most medications that are given to pediatric patients are based on weight, they're weight-based. And in order to give the appropriate weight-based dose of a medicine, you kind of sort of need a weight. So one measure would be to start looking just at how many, the proportion of all patients in children under uh, say 18 years old who have a documented weight in kilograms. Some people will um, say, well, we have a length-based um, system. So they are red or a green on their uh, Braslow tape, for example, and that's fine. Document that as well. That would meet the measure. Second, sticking within the realm of pediatric patients, the majority of pediatric patients that we see are either for trauma or for respiratory issues. So focusing on the respiratory issues, a great measure to look at would be for all children under 18, what proportion that, uh, I'm sorry, for all children under 18 who have some sort of respiratory complaint, what proportion had a pulse oximetry and respiratory rate document? So just straight up assessment measure. A subsequent measure to that would be for those children between two and 18 years old with asthma or bronchospasm, what proportion received a beta agonist? So that's a treatment-based algorithm or um, assessment. Now, I think we can also look at things like stroke. So for patients who called 911 for a, an acute stroke, what proportion of them had a documented stroke scale? So we know that um, identifying the stroke and notifying the hospital that a patient is having a stroke so they can get ready is critical to the outcome of stroke patients. Let's make sure that we're actually um, assessing and documenting these stroke scales. Similarly, if you take a look at uh, some of the other measures that are out there, for example, the Heart Association's Mission Lifeline, um, this is one that you mentioned, Mick. So patients that are 35 years old or older with non-traumatic chest pain, what proportion of them got a 12-lead ECG within 10 minutes? 
a similar one would be what proportion of those patients received aspirin or had a documented reason not to give aspirin. And then finally, when we look at in our system where we have PCI labs that we can take our patients with STEMIs to, is the proportion of patients who have a STEMI that got the cath lab activated or notified within three minutes of the first positive 12 lead. So I think those are some good places to start in terms of clinical measures. Now, one additional measure that I think uh, is really important, particularly if we're continuing to focus on um, lowering response times, is the proportion of patients, it, this is a safety issue because one of the challenges of getting places fast is we think that we have to use red lights and sirens to do it. And when we use red lights and sirens, it increases the likelihood of collision and injuries, including death, to the occupants of the ambulance as well as to the other people on the road. So a safety measure is of all 911 calls, the proportion of calls that went to the scene without lights and sirens. And then a sister measure to that is the proportion of all 911 calls that result in transport to a hospital that went without lights and sirens. So those are the measures overall that I think would be important to start with. And again, these are process measures. I think once these are established, the important thing is to continue developing the measures, and now we start looking at outcome measures. So the proportion of patients with traumatic pain that had a reduction in their pain, the proportion of patients with hypoxic or hypercapnic respiratory failure who had an improvement, and the ultimate outcome measure that we always look at in cardiac arrest is the proportion of patients with cardiac arrest who survived neurologically intact. Which I, I think brings up an important distinction is there may be some measures for the specific EMS uh, provider agency, whether it's uh, a transport or a non-transport agency, perhaps evaluated as a team since EMS is very much a team sport. But uh, it also gets us to the issue of system measures where we are evaluating the system as a whole to include 911 uh, non-transport, transport, the ER, the cath lab or other specialty facility, et cetera, uh, for, for the totality of the outcome. And cardiac arrest is a good example of that. It wouldn't be appropriate to hold only EMS accountable uh, for the outcome, uh, but it would be appropriate uh, for performance measures at a systems level, which is uh, uh, a, a different layer of the onion we won't get into today, but uh, the points are, are very well taken. Also joining us today is Tom Wasorek. He is one of the principals at the Center for Public Safety Management, the consulting firm closely associated with the International City and County Management Association. And Tom is an expert in fire and emergency medical services operation. He has a background as a police officer, fire chief, director of public safety, and as a city manager and is former executive director for the Center for Public Safety Excellence. He served as a vice chairperson of the Commission on Fire Officer Designation and served as a vice chair for the Commission on Fire Service Accreditation International. Thanks for joining us today, Tom. Thank you very much. I uh, appreciate being here. So you work primarily with municipalities and government operated EMS service providers. Do you have any comments or concerns about how units of local government might try to implement service level agreements with clinical performance requirements uh, with their government operated EMS providers? Um, we work with communities across the country and we continue to, to uh, work. Uh, uh, and the, the EMS problem, I guess, is the most difficult uh, for city management and local government uh, elected officials to understand as well as to put in practice. Uh, there's a lot of misconceptions out there uh, that the quickest do is going to be the most successful outcomes, that everybody being a paramedic is going to improve outcomes. And, and so there's a lot of anecdotal information, but not that much uh, metric data-driven uh, performance measures out there. And so 
making the conversion, uh, I think uh, it was best said by uh, a friend of mine who pointed out that most of the EMS systems today that uh, municipalities use uh, are actually driven by station locations or workload, lack thereof, um, and not really looking at what are the clinical outcomes, what are the performance measures that you'd like to uh, undertake, and then how are you going to come to those uh, resolutions? And so putting all of that into contractual arrangements or expectations becomes even more difficult because there's a, a, a lot of, of stuff out there, but not a lot of uh, good linked performance and metric measures. So, you know, one of the things that's going on in the industry is the National EMS Quality Alliance, and, and they're working towards establishing these na nationally standardized measures. So assume for the moment that NEMSQA uh, is very successful in, in at least giving us some uh, well-vetted performance measures to work from. Uh, take that as an assumption. Do you see any political issues or operational issues within units of local government in say putting a some sort of a requirement whether it's in the form of a service level agreement or something else uh, that really kind of you know obligates uh, in a very specific way the government operated service uh, to deliver uh, in much the same way we see with uh, private ambulance services and performance-based contracts Yes, uh, I think the biggest challenge will be going against tradition. Uh, in the fire service, the the kind of the bragging right is that it's a hundred years of service, unhampered by progress, uh, and you're making a substantial jump uh, from every call being a hot call or going lights and siren, getting there as quick as possible, and assuming that that is going to result in the best outcome you're now changing to different levels of service, triaging the call prior to dispatch. Chances are 80%, at least as we look across the country of, of calls are not going to require an emergency response. Uh, lights and siren, they could get there in 12 to 24 minutes with no difference in, in outcomes. And so making that change as well as do we need paramedics on every call? Do we need uh, every person that's going to respond to this call to be a paramedic? Those are significant changes that will probably run up against uh, union contracts, uh, bargaining uh, agreements, uh, and will probably result in, in some challenge uh, that, that uh, it's lacking in validity. And so I think the biggest challenge will be educating elected officials that these are the standards. Uh, we we constantly face the battle, uh, at least as elected officials, that well, you know, we need to look at data, we need to look at performance, we need to look at outcomes. This is going to move that needle considerably uh, down the road. That there are going to be performance metrics you're going to be reviewing, uh, and that's not usually included or or regularly looked at by most. Uh, uh, municipal systems or even in contractual arrangements. A lot of times communities lack the sophistication or their agreement lacks the sophistication to analyze performance based on uh, you know, metrics and, and uh, performance standards. Well, very good. So let's go back to the live portion of uh, this webinar uh, for your questions and comments. All right. We already have some great questions in the queue. I'm gonna start with one from Mike Grill. Marty McCurry in The Price We Pay states outcome results may not be as important as the appropriateness of the treatment. He argues that a C-section may have a great outcome. However, if it wasn't performed for an appropriate reason, then the outcome was suboptimal as the patient didn't clinically require it. Regarding EMS, how would that apply? Could one example be correctly following a STEMI protocol when the patient was having a TIA or stroke? Thoughts on how this applies to EMS? Dr. Jarvis, do you want to take that one? Well, I'll go ahead and take it then. Uh, the way I would re respond to that question, Mike, and it's an excellent one, is 
I think we would need to consider having a measure for the accuracy of the STEMI diagnosis. And then uh, within that group of patients that had an appropriately selected diagnosis for STEMI, uh, how well did, did we then comply with all of the process steps or the protocol within that uh, so that we don't end up uh, measuring compliance to protocol when the protocol itself was sol selected incorrectly uh, would be the way I would recommend we structure that. And that all kind of gets into the inclusion and exclusion criteria that are set up uh, for how those individual measures are structured. Is there another one in the queue, Kelly? Or do you have uh, one, uh, one yourself? I do, I have another one from Brooke. Um, Brooks asks, do you have any concern that mandatory reporting of clinical KPIs may hamper quality improvement efforts? Glenn, would you like to take a stab at that one? Sure, Mick. Uh, there was a, I got dropped off the webinar at one point, so that may be happening to other panelists as well, but I was able to get back in. Um, yes, I think that uh, mandatory reporting, as long as it, the way it's reported recognizes HIPAA requirements and is used for operational purposes, and that's clearly designated in the reporting structure. Uh, I don't know how that would adversely affect quality assurance uh, efforts. In fact, I think it is essential to share the information in order to systematically identify opportunities for quality improvement and to uh, you know, define initiatives. So, but I do agree that, but I think the, the, the question might be trying to get at is, how do we structure it so that the information is provided in a HIPAA compliant way so that it is used for operational and, and not some other purpose? Great. Well, um, as we let some other questions populate, Tom, do any cities or counties have formal clinical performance requirements for government operated ambulance or rescue services stated in service level agreements or similar documents or policies? that you're aware of? Or are you aware of any efforts to move in that direction? Um, we're starting to see at least the concept of that come in. But right now, I haven't we haven't run across any across uh, across the country. Uh, we've seen active participation in the form of the medical director uh, involving themselves in developing uh, those those uh, models. But from the city standpoint, I think uh, it's fairly new. I think communicating that out to managers and then getting it implemented uh, would be a great uh, a great undertaking. And I think it's timely. Well, I think we're about out of time. Well, I would like to thank our guest panelist, Tom Weiserek from the Center for Public Safety Management can be reached by email, phone, or the center's website. Dr. Jarvis can be reached by email, phone, Twitter, as well as through the podcast at EMS Lighthouse Project. And Glenn Leland can be reached by email, phone, or LinkedIn. For more information about the new NCDR eReports EMS reporting service in the works at the American College of Cardiology, please visit acc.org slash eReports EMS. On that page, you can also access the links to view prior webinars from the series. Well, thank you, for Kelly, uh, for uh, filling in as our moderator today. Great job. I'd like to thank uh, all of our, our guests as well and all of the attendees. We, uh, we did uh, run pretty short on time for questions. So if you do have any questions for comments, I would encourage you to go ahead and email them in, and uh, we'll respond as uh, best we can uh, as quickly as possible. Also keep your eyes out for the link for the archive version of this webinar. I would encourage you to share the link uh, with your colleagues. And so on behalf of the American College of Cardiology and the Center for Systems Improvement, thanks for being on the webinar and that concludes today's presentation. Thank you.